There's only one place I can start. Uh, first and foremost, it's an honor to be here today. It's an honor to open this conference. Um, but anytime I am in front of a first responder, law enforcement, firefighter organization, or gathering, the only place that I can start is by saying thank you. Coming from somebody who spent the vast majority of their adult life in the military, it is incredibly common for people to come up to me and say thank you for your service, which I appreciate and I say you're very welcome. The vast majority of it was my pleasure. Not all of it by any stretch, but most of it was. And I don't often hear people expressing their gratitude for what the people in this room do. My job was very easy in terms of I knew when I was gonna be on and when I was going to be off. I would train for 18 months at home and then go overseas and actually do my job. Most of the training I did was away from home. All of the deployments overseas obviously were, but every single day that I was away from home, either training or on deployment, People like the men and women in this room were there watching out for my family. And you are the veneer, the very thin veneer that holds this country together. And I wish more people would take the time to appreciate that and say thank you. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you for what you do for everybody in this room. Now, yes. Spoiler alert, I have zero days of experience working in law enforcement and zero days of experience having anything to do with traffic safety. Uh, if you looked at my driving record, I actually might be on the other side of the column. <laughs> having said that, uh, when I read the mission statement of trying to drive uh, a state towards zero deaths, the odds are stacked against you. And the likelihood of you succeeding, I would say, is low. Now. I have a lot of experience working in that environment, an environment where the odds are clearly stacked against you and the odds of you succeeding are low. And what I can tell you from my experience is that there's no magic piece of gear. People look at the SEAL teams and they wonder how we're able to accomplish the things that we do. And very often they want to talk about the snazzy uniforms or the night vision goggles or the rifles. And those things are all great and they help us do our job. But they're not the reason that we're successful. There's no app, there's no protocol, and there's no system that's going to actually get you closer to zero. If it terminates in a human being, you have a choice of weapons in your arsenal. And I've been very fortunate in my military career to be surrounded by and had the ability to tinker with some very powerful weapons. They didn't let me take any of them home, which is a problem, but I got to experience a lot of amazing ones. But the most impactive or impactful and effective weapon that I have seen more so than ordnance and bombs that come off the wings of aircraft is leadership. If it terminates in a human being and you want to make a difference, the most important weapon that you have in your arsenal is leadership. Before I get into leadership though, I'm going to give you a quick rundown of my bio. Uh, so if you guys, there you go, put the bio up on the screen. This is hopefully give you some context for where I come from and the community that I was raised in because it's going to help uh, solidify the leadership lessons that I hope to leave you with. I've been to many conferences like this as a participant where somebody gets up and they talk about leadership and it's broad and it's conceptual and it's, okay, it was an entertaining presentation and five minutes after they were done, somebody could have asked me what they were talking about and I had no idea. My goal is to cover some concepts, but leave you with practical points that you could utilize starting right now that will make you a better leader, which hopefully will help drive that statistic closer to zero. So, my bio. As mentioned, I enlisted uh, in the military August 1st of 1996. Now, by a show of hands, anybody here with military experience? A, a fair amount. Most people, and I'm sure the people who raised their hands would agree, that the enlisted ranks in the military are not traditionally looked at for the leadership ranks, especially in the beginning. Later on in your career, you're going to be put into leadership positions, but if you enlist in the Navy and you're an E1 or an E2, nobody is looking to you to be a leader. My favorite job and favorite jobs that I held were the ones that I was the junior man because I didn't have to worry about being in charge very much. And if it got to a point that I needed to make a combat decision, the likelihood was everybody else was dead. So it didn't really matter what I did. 
There was no way for me to make a mistake because nobody was going to judge me. So I started on the enlisted side of the house. I was an enlisted SEAL for 12 years, and in early uh, 2008, I put a commissioning package in, and I switched over to the officer ranks and was an officer, worked my way up to a lieutenant, which is middle management at best in the Navy, until I was medical retired the last day of June in 2013. As far as what I actually did in my career or where I started, I started my career at SEAL Team 5. Your organization likely survives off of acronyms, much like the military does. It's a bureaucracy if it's not anything else. SEAL is an acronym. It stands for Sea, Air, and Land. It is the environments with which we are supposed to be able to fight. I've never been in a fight in the ocean or the sea, and I've certainly never been in one in the air. So I guess at the end of the day, I have an L, and that's about all I've ever done in my career. As far as the numbers, people ask about this all the time, so I'm just going to cover it right now. The number actually means nothing other than where you are geographically located. Pre-9-11, it actually had meaning. Uh, Post-9-11, it doesn't matter. If it's an odd number, it is in San Diego. If it's an even number, it's in Virginia Beach. That's all it means. So I started at SEAL Team 5, and the conceptual portion of my career, meaning we would train for war, and then we would deploy overseas in the hopes that something would happen and nothing did. That was my time at SEAL Team 5 because that was pre-9-11. The shift in my career between conceptual and practical, and likely everybody in the military, happened at 9-11. And that, if you can go back to the slide, uh, occurred when I made in my shift to Naval Special Warfare Development Group, which means SEAL Team 6. People make a big deal about it. You shouldn't make a big deal about it. From there, I went to the Naval Special Warfare Center, which is the training command that oversees the initial pipeline to become a SEAL, which I'll talk about later, and then finished my career at SEAL Team 3, which is a poor nine iron shot from SEAL Team 5. In my career, I did two pre-9-11 deployments, like I mentioned, those were at SEAL Team 5, and then five deployments to OEF, which is Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, and three deployments to OIF, Operation Iraqi Freedom, obviously in Iraq. And the jobs I held throughout my career. The first job is, a, you're not going to find it anywhere in doctrine. It is just an inside term that we call an assaulter. It basically was, I was a soldier. I had a set of body armor, a helmet, a gun, and I was expected to do my job, not kill myself and anybody else around me. That was all I was required to do. Nobody worked for me. I just was required to complete the tasks of my job. After being in for a while, I had a little bit of experience and knowledge under my belt, so I had a few assaulters working for me, and they gave me a new title. I was a team leader, four to six people working for me. The shift between enlisted and officer occurred between the team leader and the platoon commander. By the time I became a platoon commander, I had 16 people working for me with a variety of experience from their first day on the job to 10 to 15 years in the SEAL teams. In my last job as an operation, operations officer, I was overseeing all of the training for the entire West Coast SEAL community. Every command, every SEAL team that was preparing to go on deployment had to go through 18 months of training uh, that the command I was the operations officer for was responsible for ensuring that they met the standards and uh, uh, received the training that they needed to go overseas. And at that point, I had a few hundred people working underneath me. The beauty of the community that I come from, if you could go back to the uh, text on the slide, at any point in time in my career, from my first day until my last day, I knew exactly what was expected of me. And it wasn't a matter of going and finding a three-ring binder and looking it up. It was constantly and continuously reinforced to me from the leadership above me. So at any point in time in that career, you could have asked me, what is expected of you? What are your roles and responsibilities? And I could have answered them. A lot of them were very simple. And the reason I titled this slide Battlefield Expectations is that I don't consider the 18 months of training we would do before deployment to actually be our job. Our job started and stopped when we went overseas. And it's important to understand that in the SEAL community, as far as the Navy goes in general, the SEAL community draws about 20% of the Navy's overall budget, and that's submarines, aircraft, helicopters, all of the rest of the naval personnel. 
from a manpower perspective, we're less than 1% of the actual Navy. So we draw an inordinately large portion of their budget. We're a small force. When I go overseas, I almost always never work for somebody who is in the Navy. It's almost always Marine Corps or Army, and they're generals on both sides. When we show up in a battle space, if you could reduce what they expect from us to one thing, it is this, accomplish the mission. I was a part of a team. I was never by myself, and my actions were never judged unless they had a negative consequence to the team. But I knew at all times that regardless of who we worked for and what we were doing, I was expected to accomplish the mission. Now, having said that, as an individual, I had to constantly and consistently think about my actions because I have to understand the second and third order effects of the things that I do on the greater team. A perfect example of how an individual's actions can completely erase team success, uh, and this happened unfortunately more often than I wish uh, that it did. My first deployment to Iraq, uh, we were looking for individuals and I wore a football sleeve on my left arm. And it would have a picture of the individual, but more importantly, what we were looking for was cell phones, specifically SIM cards inside of cell phones. And I know if you're working in a law enforcement uh, role, you have an understanding of how much information is held on that SIM card. There, how many people in here, is there anybody in here who doesn't have a cell phone on them? I need to go that direction, because if I ask if anybody has one, I can't even see. All right, so in my old job, if you carry an electronic device, it is extremely easy for me to find, fix, and then kill you. I can pattern your behavior. I can pattern your life. I can tell who you're talking to. I can determine where you are and who you are meeting with. We had that control of the cell phone network in Iraq. So we would shut it down during the daytime, and we would only turn it on at night. And I'll get into why we did that in a few bullet points. And we would go out, and we would look for individuals or cell phones that are associated with those individuals. For me, every single day that I went out the gate, I knew whether or not I had accomplished the mission because I either came back with the cell phone or the individual or I did not. So on one of those evenings, early on in the war, we were in downtown Baghdad. Also surprisingly enough, or perhaps not surprising, sometimes when you show up at these people's houses, they're not extremely happy that you're there to see them. And I don't know what their problem is, I'm just there to have a little chat, you know, Hey, can I check out your phone real fast? We were in downtown Baghdad. We were successful in finding a handset. And in an urban environment like that, the height that you are off the ground matters. I know a lot of you uh, work in a tactical environment and you understand that high ground is always gonna trump low ground. And in this particular night, we were in a one-story building surrounded by three-story buildings. We had found the individual and the handset that we were after that night. So we had met uh, our first priority of the general, the Marine Corps general that we were working for. We had accomplished our mission. In the course of being in that area, we started becoming engaged uh, by the surrounding buildings. We can't carry that much gear with us because we physically have to carry it in our hands. And most of the time, what we rely on is aircraft to release ordnance to level the playing field in a tactical environment. And there was one individual with us that night who was on his first combat deployment. And this was, if it wasn't his first combat mission, it was maybe his third. So very early in the story arc. And his only job was to talk to the aircraft and to get the aircraft to release ordnance on the target that we wanted destroyed. In the military, and I'm sure you use GPS all the time, if I can give you a six-digit grid coordinate that is accurate to 100 meters, they will not drop a bomb. If I can give you an eight-digit grid coordinate that's accurate down to 10 meters, they still will not drop a bomb. If I can give you 10-digit grid that is accurate to one meter, and a pilot will release a GPS-guided piece of ordnance. The individual on the radio passed a 10-digit grid coordinate. It was entered into the avionics of the aircraft. The ordnance was released, and it proceeded to go exactly where it was programmed to go, which in this particular case was into the uh, embassy of a sovereign allied nation. Now, they weren't very happy about that. Even though I think we did them a favor, the place was a total dump, they got to rebuild, I'm sure we paid for it. They didn't ask for my uh, assessment on that. Now, this was at nighttime, 
There was no loss of life. But that individual's actions, and what had happened is he inverted two digits. So the simple inversion of two digits, this bomb landed miles away from where we actually were. We had the individual that we were looking for. When we got back to base, we told ourselves we accomplished the mission. And what did our boss say? You guys are completely done working. We were not allowed to operate for the next 30 days because the individual that owned that battle space no longer trusted us. For the next three months, we were not allowed to release ordnance from aircraft because the individual that we worked for did not trust us. One person's actions, the secondary and tertiary effects of that person inverting those digits rippled and had geopolitical effect because I'm sure somebody somewhere had to talk to that nation about what happened. It wasn't me, but somebody had to, and it shut us down. And my entire career was predicated on that understanding. My actions can have huge and wide sweeping impact. In addition to that, we operated in a very dangerous environment and we did everything we could to mitigate risk. But we also became very, or we focused on being very aware of the fact that we cannot become risk adverse. You cannot reduce the risk to zero. If you can, it means you're doing something that isn't important. And there is a difference between risking your life and the life of those that work for you and gambling. And you have to respect that difference. I'll never gamble with my life or people's life, but I am willing to take risk as long as I take the time to assess it and mitigate it. Safety is a huge factor when it comes to being a SEAL. Why do we turn off the cell phone network? Because we're taught to exploit our tactical and technological advantages. I can see at night. I have IR lasers on my weapon. I can aim them at night. I have radios. I have things that make the nighttime more advantageous for me to operate. So I use them. But all of those things that I just said, the weapons, the lasers, the night vision goggles, none of those are inherent to the SEAL teams. We get those from supporting assets. And if we chose to be an exclusive organization and push everybody away from us and say, uh, we don't want to share our secrets, I don't want to share with you the special things that we have because I don't want you to get them, we wouldn't have the capability that we do. So. We are always taught to be, instead of exclusive, inclusive. We look left and right to optimize our attached or assign and any of our supporting resources. When I speak to the business world, I tell them, look outside of your individual business unit. Involve people in your planning process that you may think are outside of the realm of what you're planning for. You'll consistently be blown away by the input that they have because they're objective. They're farther away from the problem than most people are who are living with it two inches in front of their face. This bullet point essentially uh, applies to everything in life if you change a few words around. Constantly attempt to improve your fighting position. Regardless of where I am, always be looking for something that is better. Constantly attempt to improve your relationship with your spouse, your significant other. Constantly attempt to improve your parenting skills. Never accept the status, accept the status quo. And just because it worked yesterday doesn't mean it's gonna work today. And lastly, when it came to battlefield expectations, Regardless of whether or not my assigned orders were clearly defined or they were ambiguous, if somebody needed to take charge and lead and there was no call being made, it was incumbent on me to do so. I didn't look for somebody else to make a decision. I looked for the opportunity to make one. Now, let's actually talk about some leadership. And I choose this slide because there's a lot going on here. Mostly there's people in a lot of pain, so I enjoy the slide immensely. This is a picture from BUDS. BUDS stands for Basic Underwater Demolition SEAL Training. It is a six month pipeline that everybody has to go through, both enlisted and officer, which is one thing that makes our community slightly unique. Enlisted and officer go, they start the first day together and they finish the last day together. They have the same experience through the entire uh, story arc of this initial journey, which allows us to do some interesting things. One, it allows us to sleep, uh, screen for certain leadership characteristics, but two, it allows us to plant the seed for the ethos and the models that we wanna see portrayed throughout a career. We get everybody at their origin, so we have the chance to have an impact early on in their career. 
Buds is an exercise in breaking the individual of the sense of me and developing in them a sense of we. We do that starting on day one with a philosophy called the swim buddy. And essentially, for six months, you are not allowed to go anywhere farther than six feet away from another human being. And if you do something that deserves a remediation, because we're not allowed to say punishment, so we say we're going to remediate you because it's a bureaucracy. If you do something that requires a remediation, guess who shares in that with you? Your swim buddy. If your swim buddy does something that is amazing, which never happens, but I guess in theory, does something that's amazing that deserves a reward, you also share in that. And this is an interesting recalibration of how individuals think. It takes about two weeks for this to happen. The first few days of BUDS are essentially yelling at students and asking them to do things with a timeline that is unreasonable. The best way to introduce stress in a training environment is to pull the stopwatch out. Give them an unrealistic timeline and you will see the wheels come off the bus. So as an instructor, I mean, I, got to, I was a, a participant in a picture like this and I also was an instructor. The instructor role was much more fun because I could stand there with a cup of coffee and spray a water hose in somebody's face as opposed to being laying on my back having a water hose sprayed in my face. But it gave me an opportunity to see both sides of this coin. For the first two weeks, you would go to a student and you would say, you need to go, the classic thing is go hit the surf, which means run to the ocean, dive into the ocean, roll around in the sand and come back. Go hit the surf, you have 30 seconds. The first time I tell a student to do that, what do you think they do? They get up, they run off, and what do they forget? Their swim buddy. So we stop them, and we remediate them on the spot for about an hour, so it sticks. Later on in that day, I will tell the same student to do something else again with a ridiculous timeline, and what do you think they do? Exactly the same thing, because they've only been at this for about a half of a day. Two weeks into this program, Regardless of what I tell a student to do and regardless of the timeline that I give them, they will do one critical thing before moving. And that is they will turn their head to the left and right and they will look for their swim buddy. And that is the beginning of the origins of teamwork and selflessness inside of the SEAL teams. So we start with two people and then we build into what you see in this picture. So I'll describe what you're looking at. This is an evolution in buds. This is a race, and that's all it is. Those boats are designed to effortlessly cut through the water. They hold seven people. It's really fun to take them through the surf, and you can actually, if you time it properly, can surf waves in sitting in the boat. So we don't let them do that because it's way more uncomfortable to have them on their head running around, right? Buds isn't designed to be comfortable. It's designed to be painful, to weed people out who shouldn't be there. So we put people into boat crews. And each boat crew has seven individuals. As you can see, there's three on each side, and the person in the back is either the officer or the senior enlisted personnel, if we run out of officers. Now, physiologically, I need to explain what you're looking at in this picture. I can't tell you because the picture isn't zoomed in enough as to who in that picture is an officer or who is enlisted. But what I can tell you is, if you can make it to this picture, and this picture occurs in Hell Week, which I'll describe in a moment, if you can make it to, I'm actually going to go back even further. If you can make it to the first day of training, physiologically, you have the ability to graduate. From a contractile potential, endurance, stamina, strength, you have it. And I say that because the route to day one is extremely long and it's extremely competitive. You take running tests, swimming tests, academic tests, uh, psychological tests. If you can get there on day one, you have the capacity to graduate. And I could shift one person from one boat to another boat, and it's not going to make a difference. I would say there is between a 1% to a 3% physiological difference between students. And essentially what I'm saying is all of these students are exactly the same. Now, in this actual picture, Hell Week starts on a Sunday at about 8 p.m. It ends Friday roughly between 4 to 6 p.m. You get two hours of sleep on Wednesday, and that is it. This is essentially what you're doing for the entire time. 80% of the attrition in BUDS occurs during this week. What they're doing is they're racing. 
because competition is important and everything in BUDS is a race. So we have them race over a variety of distances. Some of them are 10 miles long, some of them are 400 meters. And what happens by Tuesday, the same thing happened over and over and over again for the 12 classes that I was there for. There was a boat crew that regardless of the duration of the race would win every single time by a very large distance. And then there was a conglomerate of boat crews that can only really be described as the peloton in bike racing, who I think were under the boats like, hey guys, if we just all finish at the same time, they can't really punish us all, can they? Wrong. And then, <laughs> I had those conversations, that's how I know what they're saying under there. We will crush everybody equally. But I'm not worried about the peloton because they're all working hard and they're all finishing together. So there's the winning boat crew, a huge gap, there's the peloton, and then there's a losing boat crew. And by Tuesday, it's the same boat crew every single time. And the gap or the margin of defeat is almost always equal to the margin of victory. So on Wednesday morning, what I would do is we would line all of the boats up on the beach and I would get on a bullhorn. I would say, boat crew leaders, bring it in. So only the leadership, only the person in the back of the boat would come to me. And I would say, who is the winning boat crew leader? And his hand would just rocket into the air because he was very proud. Awesome, you've been doing a really good job. Guess what boat crew you are now the leader of? The losing boat crew. Then I would say, who's the leader of the losing boat crew? This individual's hand would come up at a much slower pace and velocity than the winning boat crew leader. And I would say to him, guess what boat crew you are now in charge of? The winning boat crew. Now. The reason I wanted to talk about the physiology of the students is it's important to talk about the shift that I was making in this situation. What is the only thing that I changed? The leadership. Now we would line them up on their boats and we would race. And What do you think happened on the very next race? Absolutely nothing is the answer. I wish it was different because it would be very concrete in the point that I'm trying to make. The winning boat crew, they won again. But what was interesting was the margin by which they won. It would almost always half, if not even more, three quarters decrease. The peloton was the peloton, and then the losing boat crew had that same difference in finishing length. And eventually, two or three races later, the traditionally winning boat crew, they would disappear into the peloton and another boat crew would emerge. And the traditionally losing boat crew would disappear into the peloton and another boat crew would emerge. Why? I have absolutely no idea. I don't know if the winning boat crew leader was charismatic. I don't know if he had better interpersonal skills. Uh, I don't know if he just had the ability to inspire people. And I don't know if the losing boat crew leader was an only child and didn't want to share their toys with other people. I don't know what it was. But what I do know, and I saw over and over and over again, was the impact that leadership has on every single person that you are going to touch in your life. That boat, think of that as your team. Think of that as your family. Think of that as your relationship. Think of that as your job. It doesn't matter what metaphor you choose to look at the boat as. The eliciting amazing performance or, in the case of bad leadership, throwing a 2,000-pound anchor out of the boat that destroys everybody around you, it doesn't matter the environment. The result is going to be the same. It's the most infectious and impactful tool that I've ever seen in training and in combat. Oftentimes when I speak to people about leadership, and I'm gonna get into how we actually teach and train leadership in the SEAL organization here in a moment. Oftentimes when I talk to organizations about leadership, they make a very critical error when they start asking questions to me. And this one is an alarm bell that goes off for me in the back of my head. What they start doing is they start talking about their people instead of talking about themselves. Oftentimes, especially in the modern day, I get this term time and time and time again. You ready for it? Millennials. 
Do you guys have any of those, Minnesota? I have some in Montana. I'll be more than happy to ship them all over here to you. But I'll hear leaders talking about leadership and leadership challenges. And one of the first things that I hear often is, I have these, I have these millennials. I'm like, okay. Usually they pair that with, they have a sense of entitlement. It's like classic pairing of like whitefish and Chardonnay. They almost always come together. And then you have the leader who's just had enough and he's like, my people just suck. That, I'm like, okay, I feel bad for your people, but you and I are gonna be able to communicate very well because at least you're open and uh, honest about how you feel. The reason that this makes me concerned when I hear leaders talking about their people is that leadership has nothing to do with the people that work for you. Leadership is a top-down issue, not a bottom-up issue. If you want to find the problem in your team and in your leadership organization, don't look at your people. Go find a bathroom and turn the light switch on and look in the mirror and look at yourself because that is where the problem and the solution are going to be able to be found. If I could go back, and I don't go back for the AV guys, the slide on battlefield expectations. Does anybody remember what the first bullet point was? What the nation and the people that I worked for overseas expected of me at all times? Accomplish the mission. Was there an asterisk next to that that said, unless populated by millennials? No. The reality is, right now, the SEAL community and the SEAL teams are populated with millennials. I've seen it firsthand. The last time I was at uh, SEAL Command on the West Coast, it was skinny jeans and hair gel at a degree that made me, I had to go out into the surf zone and dry heave for a little bit. I'm not joking, it made me sick to my stomach. Don't wear jeans that tight, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> it, <laughs> and I know I'm getting off topic, but it's, it's an important point, almost as important as zero deaths in traffic safety. <laughs> the SEAL community though, that is populated with these millennials is more capable than the SEAL community that I left in 2013. They're doing more, they're doing better, and they are more advanced in capability than the community that I left, regardless of the fact that yes, they happen to be populated by a group of people that were born after a certain day. Why is that? Because the leadership doesn't care. Leadership is about finding a way to bridge the gap to inspire and elicit performance from your people, not pointing the finger at them and telling them, you know, you're responsible for this shortcoming. No, if you want to point the finger at somebody, again, go find that bathroom again, flip the light switch off and look into the mirror and have that conversation. So how do we actually do this in the SEAL teams? Working towards getting out of the conceptual and working towards the practical. First, I think it's important to define what leadership actually is. And the easiest way for me to do that is to describe what it is not. It's not rank, it's not title, and it's not position. If that is all that leadership was, we would never see somebody in those positions failing at leadership. Who here has seen somebody failing while in a leadership position? I have. The best leaders that I've ever worked for in my entire life were in the SEAL teams. The worst leaders that I have ever encountered in my entire life were in the SEAL teams. Good and bad. Leadership positions and leadership, sometimes they're commensurate. Oftentimes they are not. So what is it? In the SEAL community, it's comprised of three things. First and foremost, leadership is always discussed and employed from the perspective of empowerment. Not of the leader, but empowerment of your team, empowerment of your individuals that work for you. Secondly, with empowerment, it's, in, it's accountability. And I, I've listed off these two things before uh, in the business world, and you see, you see people start getting wide-eyed. They're like, yes, empower me. I'm like, oh, whoa, easy, psycho. Empower your team, right? Accountability, yes, my people are accountable to me. No, also wrong. As a leader, you're accountable to your people, right? So empower your people, maintain your accountability to them, and then the third one, and the most difficult one, and the one that requires the most maintenance, is trust. Even though the military is a rank-driven organization, and I know law enforcement is as well, it is not rank that enables a subordinate to do something outside of themselves that may cost them their life. 
It is trust in a disciplined leader that is going to empower your subordinates. If they only look at you and are doing what you're saying because of your rank, you had better be there to enforce what you're telling them to do. Because when you're not there, odds are they likely will deviate if the risk-reward ratio skews too far. If that individual trusts you and places their trust in you, it will empower them to take those actions even when you're not physically present. The reason I say trust is difficult, again, by a show of hands, how many people have ever worked with or for somebody that you placed an inherent level of trust in, and then over the course of knowing them or working for them, they did something or said something that started to erode that trust until it was gone. Have we all shared that experience? Now, I'm not a fan of absolutes. I hate 0% and 100%, and I hate always, and I hate never. I personally have never been able to put my trust back in somebody completely with whom I have lost it. Perhaps you in this room are able to do that, but from a leadership perspective, each and every time a leader has lost my trust, that has stayed with me. So as a leader, it requires constant maintenance, weekly, daily, hourly, minute by minute if you need to. Empowerment, accountability, and trust. Now before I get into the leadership characteristics and end with the actual practical way that we lead, by a show of hands, how many people in this room are a leader? Okay. I ask this question to every audience. I have yet to have every single person's hand go up into the air. And we're going to talk about this here in a minute. The characteristics that we're looking for. Can you go back to the slide, please? I like this picture because, again, like I said, officer are enlisted side by side. The characteristics that we are screening for apply to officer and enlisted, regardless of rank, title, or time in the military. We expect this at all levels. It starts with, for us, humility. We are screening for people who can control their ego. Oftentimes when I say this, people will write down, be egoless. And there's a problem with that statement, and the biggest problem is that it's not possible. If somebody tells you that they don't have an ego, you need to use that person with extreme caution. Because what are they actually telling you if they say, I have no ego, don't worry about me? They're saying that their ego can't actually fit in the room, so you better make space. I am not saying be egoless. I am saying keep your ego in check. It is one of the most important characteristics that a leader can embody. Secondly to that is accountability. Now, and this is in addition to accountability to your team. In this characteristic, what I'm saying is your accountability or your willingness to own issues and mistakes. And the environment that I came from is an incredibly A-type personality. I would describe it as swimming on top of a pool that is constantly and consistently filled with piranhas. If you put a drop of blood in there, which they're looking for at all times, they're going to consume you. So one of the hardest things to do is to raise your hand and say, I just messed up, that's on me. The beauty is we have so many opportunities to train for this. And one of the best tools that you have as to whether or not your people are willing to be accountable is to listen to them talk. So for every training evolution that I've ever done, there's a debrief process that is involved. And more than likely, there's going to be an officer that debriefs for uh, chunks of personnel. You're not going to have every single person get up and talk. These debriefs are the best opportunity to listen for whether or not your leaders are willing to be accountable. We have junior officers come up. And at a very basic level, that we were tasked with clearing this room and say, hey, my name's Bob. I was in charge of uh, A team, and we were tasked with coming in here. I told Frank to go over here. I told Jeff to go over there. I told them what they needed to do, and they didn't do it the way that I told them to, and we failed, and it's on them. And at that point, we stopped the debrief, and we have a senior leader stand up, and present the debrief for the same operation or the same exercise in the manner with which we want to see it inside of the community. Hey, my name is Frank. I was in charge of A team. We were clear with, you know, tasked with clearing this room. I had one person, we were coming through that door. One person was going to come through that door. 
And you know what? It didn't go as planned. I wasn't as clear in my guidance uh, as I needed to be. I thought that the people that were working for me had an understanding of the tactics that we were using. They didn't, and that's on me. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to issues that we're going to fix are these, and we'll see you guys back out on the training field. Now, inherently, everybody sitting here listening understands the difference between those two leaders, right? What's the first person doing? Pointing the finger or throwing people underneath the bus. Has anybody ever worked for somebody like that? I have. When you're in that environment, you are almost paralyzed. You're not innovative. You don't evolve because you're afraid of making a mistake. And when you make a mistake, you know what's going to happen. You're going to get thrown under the bus so that leader can protect themselves and largely protect their ego. Whereas the other leader, what's this person doing? Right? He's providing an environment and creating an environment where his junior personnel can evolve and innovate, and they have some latitude to make mistakes. And if they do make a mistake, they know they're going to be sheltered. Accountability when it comes to success. If your team is successful, who gets the credit? The team. If the team fails, who steps up and owns it? The leader. I heard somebody say the team twice. I think it was the same voice. If the team is successful, the team gets the credit. If the team fails, the leader steps up and he takes responsibility. In the environment that I came from, it's incredibly difficult to do, but it is essential for becoming and developing yourself into being a powerful leader. So we have humility, we have accountability. This one is relatively easy, clear and concise. Even back in the, you know, with the picture of the people running underneath the boats, there's, there's almost no responsibility other than to run in this environment, but there is somebody in charge. Don't be verbose. Be clear and concise with your communication and your guidance. And we reinforce that. This is the fifth week of training. We're already talking about all these things with these individuals. And the last one is the most important one, and it's control of your emotions. In the world that I came from, we called it being calm under fire. What it really means is maintaining or the ability to maintain your objectivity regardless of what is going on around you. I say it's the single most important and impactful attribute of a leader because of the fact it is the most infectious out of all of the ones that I've covered. Humility, yes, people will draft off that. Accountability, it sets a great example. Clear and concise, people can repeat that. But if you really want to infect the people that are working around you, it comes from control of your emotions. If you're in a leadership position, Every single person that you come in contact with, every single person that you work with is watching you and listening to what you say. And they are ready to mimic your behavior, your speech, and your emotional state. How do I know this? Well, let's talk about the most important leadership position on earth. How many, uh, how many people in here are our parents? In my opinion, parenting and leadership that's as powerful as it gets. How many of you have ever seen or heard your children do something, a behavior that you weren't very proud of, and you were sitting there getting ready to ask them, where did you learn that from? And you realize the answer is, oh, from me, right? I, about a week ago, was about to come unchained on my 13-year-old son because he was being a jackass and saying some stuff he shouldn't say, and I was about to come out of my mouth, where did you learn that from? And I got about that far and I had to stop because I know where he learned it from. I know the example that was set for him. He was repeating something that I had said in jest, but it was still an example that I had set for him. Why is he watching me? Why is he listening? Why is he mimicking the things that I do? Because I'm in a leadership position. <clears throat> When it comes to control of your emotions, I highly recommend that everybody in this room take some time away from work to think about things you may be doing to those that you work with or for that may have a negative impact. I had to do this, uh, and it's just a good exercise in general. Uh, I, de I determined for me two hard and fast rules that I could not deviate from because of the impact it was having on the people that I worked with. The first one, was very simple, and it was running. Anytime uh, 
and if it, the first slide, when I, this is about when I was in my platoon commander phase. I had 16 people working for me, and at that point in time, I had more experience than anybody else that was in that platoon. Making decisions in a combat environment with compressed timelines is already hard enough. So the things that make that easier are experience, uh, the ability to pattern recognize, because that's a lot of what we did is pattern recognition, but you need experience for that, and then time, as much time as possible. Any time that I would run, and I noticed this on a training evolution where there was no reason that I should have been running, but I started running, everybody else around me also started running. So I had just reduced the amount of time that they had to make decisions, and they didn't have the knowledge and experience that I had. So I was basically setting up the people that worked for me for failure unintentionally. And when I realized that, I realized that I had to constantly and consistently manage physically what I was doing. So I set a hard and fast rule. I would never run again unless my life was in grave danger, and then I would crush Usain Bolt out of the gates for like 40, and then I would walk again. The second one, and this will apply uh, to anybody here who works with a radio was the tone of my voice. I was in a building and it would be, there is no reason ever that we would have an entire seal element in a room like this. Regardless of the size, we would be spread out. And my point in saying that is, as we communicate with radios. I was in one room of a structure and it happened to be uh, like a horseshoe shaped building. So I could see across the structure and I was actually talking on the radio to a person that I could see, they didn't know that I could see them. And for whatever reason, Again, in a training environment, there was no reason for me to be emotionally elevated, but I started yelling into the radio. And when that person heard me yelling into the radio, they started running. So again, me setting an individual up with less knowledge, less experience, shortening the amount of time that they have to make a decision, all because of the emotional state that I was pressing out over the radio. Now for the law enforcement community here, I mean, I've heard them, uh, you, can, you can hear them on YouTube. It is people who are in life and death situations and you can tell it from the tone of their voice. If you're responding to that and that's what you hear on the radio, is your emotional state escalating or de-escalating? I would say for most people, it's escalating. As your emotional state escalates, your ability to make object objective decisions goes down. I wish I could say that, you know, a slow rise in emotional state would be a slow decline in decision-making ability, but that's not my experience. As emotional state rises, ability to make decision, it falls off a cliff. Your ability to maintain control of your emotions will infect everybody that is around you, and that may be just through the tone of your voice, but I'm not sure. So I recommend you take a little bit of time away from work to think about things that you are doing that may be negatively impacting those around you. Humility, accountability, clear and concise with your guidance and your verbiage, and then control of your emotions. All of those things are designed to help make, in my world, the SEAL leader do their job. A large part of what we do is, or a large part of being a leader is your ability to maintain your situational awareness, which is a term that I hate because it's overused and almost never defined. The analogy that I can use, uh, the clearest analogy that I can use for what it means to be situationally aware is a chessboard. Anybody know how many squares are on a chessboard? 64, it's eight by eight. <clears throat> My first day in the Navy, I didn't even know that I was on a square. I didn't even know that I was on a board and that's okay because it was my first day in the Navy. When I was an assaulter, looking back, I would say I knew that I was on a square and I had no knowledge of the squares that were around me, let alone the fact that there was an entire another piece or set of chess pieces on the other side of the board. And that's okay, because it wasn't my job to be leading at that point. As a leader, you have to be able to see all 64 squares on the board. You have to know where you are, all of your pieces, and all of the competition or the enemy's pieces, depending on the world in which you operate. It's the term we use in the SEAL teams is you have to keep your head up and out. Keep your head out of the trenches. Don't do your people's job, do your job, which is to lead and maintain your situational awareness. For the law enforcement officers in here who get marksmanship training, 
When you're being taught to shoot a pistol, where do they tell you to look at in relationship to your sights? Front sight focus, have you guys all heard this before? Stare at your front sight. When you're staring at your front sight, what happens to the world past your front sight? It's blurry. It's great for pistol marksmanship, it's terrible for leadership. You need to go the other direction from some of the marksmanship skills that you've been taught. The world shouldn't be blurry, it should be crystal clear. Why is this so important? Why is situational awareness so important? Even when it comes to the uh, total zero death conference and what you are trying to achieve. It comes down to the fact that there is one single piece of information that as a SEAL in a combat environment, I can do nothing without. I am literally paralyzed without this piece of information and the same is true of the business world and the same is true of what you are trying to accomplish as an organization. And that piece of information, although it sounds simple, is very easy to lose focus on. And it is this, where am I? In combat, if I do not know where I am, and more importantly, where my people are, and I am engaged from an enemy, regardless of the direction, I can't do anything. I don't know if it's safe to shoot back. I don't even know where to start my maneuvering process from because I don't know where I am and I don't know where my people are. And the worst case scenario for me would be for a dear friend to be injured and the threat of loss of life and I have to get on the radio and I call for a medevac. And the medevac is always going to come. But what's the first thing that they're going to need to know? Where are you? And if I can't give it to them and somebody dies because of that, that is my fault. I can do nothing without knowing where I am. I never will determine where I am by looking down at my feet. You determine where you are by lifting your chin, getting your head up and out, and maintaining your objectivity on the environment around you, not getting drawn into the problem that is six inches in front of your face. So how do we do this, and how do we provide extra bandwidth for a leader? We use a theory or a concept called decentralized command, which is not a creation of the SEAL teams at all. Essentially, that means we empower our junior personnel and our junior leaders to make small decisions inside of some boundaries, inside of commander's guidance, so that the leader can focus on the bigger picture and the bigger decisions. It's the opposite of micromanaging. And micromanaging is extremely dangerous. I've actually seen micromanaging get people killed. And some people struggle as to whether or not they are a micromanager. So I'm going to give you the gold standard right here for it. You ready? All you need to do to determine whether or not you are a micromanager is listen to your people. If they come to you and they say, hey boss, good morning, what do you want me to do? You're a micromanager. Why do I say that? Because your people are coming to you and asking for guidance. They want to be told what to do and then they want to be told how to do it. If you came to me in the SEAL teams and you said, hey Andy, what's going on? What do you want me to do today? I would say I would want you to get out of my face and never ask me that question again. Because I don't expect people to come to me for guidance. What I expect of the people that work for me, and I reinforce this by teaching them, is that you have a set of ears and you have a set of eyes. You know the overall guidance. I want you to come to me with what you think should be done, and I'm going to array that with the information that I have as a leader and my understanding of the entire chessboard, and I'm going to give you some correction and then send you on your way. And I'm going to use probably an 80-20. I'm going to check in with you 20% of the time. 80% of the time, I'm orienting to the big picture. You will never be an effective leader if you're doing your people's jobs. Lead your people through the conduct of doing their jobs. Don't do it for them. This should be, and it can be tested in training. And the best drill that we had for this we do a lot of our marksmanship training or maneuvering training in the desert. We walk around. And a lot of the times we'll have a full element, 16 people, which is cut in half. So there's an officer in each one of those groups of eight. And we'll simulate gunfire, and there's a couple easy rules for a gunfight. If you get into a gunfight, the rule number one is win the gunfight. Rule number two when you're getting shot at, other than shoot back more than they're shooting at you, is maneuver. It is better to and easier to flank somebody than be flanked yourself. So win the firefight and get off the X is what we call it, maneuver. So we'll do these drills, and every time we do a workup, new people come in, new leadership comes in, new personnel, broad experience level. So we'll go out into the desert, 
and we'll set off a uh, gunfire simulation and everybody orients themselves to the gunfire and they start shooting back and and honestly it's it's beautiful it's a chaotic symphony of gunfire and one officer is making a call and they're very easy it's not complex you're you're usually moving laterally and then towards or away from the target but one person makes a call and they move and one element is shooting and the other one is maneuvering it's it's a beautiful thing to watch when it goes well and we'll give them about a week and they get really used to hearing the same voice over and over and over again so as a range safety officer we would initiate one of these drills and i would go up to the leader that i knew was getting ready to make a call and I would wait right until that point that they were supposed to make a call and I would grab them and I would say, you need to be quiet, you're dead. And we would watch. And what do you think happens? In a community that harps on leadership and stepping into the void, what do you think happens? Nothing. They, they shoot. And then the shooting slows down. And then people start looking around like, Bob? Where'd Bob go? And we blow the whistle. You're all dead. You're all dead. Why didn't you guys, why didn't somebody else step up and make a call? And the answer is, we got complacent. We were so used to hearing Bob make the call that absent Bob's voice, uh, you know, we just kept shooting. So we talk about the important, you know, we let them fail for that reason. We try to teach to that uh, learning point, And then we put him back and we hit him with the same drill again the next day. And it's utterly ridiculous how bad it is the second day. Three days later, four days later, five days later, the improvement continues, and eventually, I could pull the senior leadership, then I can just work my way down the chain of command. And there is no hiccup in firepower or maneuvering or calls being made. That is the difference between a reactive mindset, somebody, somebody working for you, waiting to hear to be told what to do from a micromanager, and a proactive mindset, an individual that is looking around, using their eyes, using their ears, and although they're not in charge, they know enough about what's going on that they can step up and make a decision if it needs to be made. That is what you need to develop in your people, a proactive mindset versus a reactive mindset. And from that picture of underneath the boats, we harp on these students from day one that in the absence of leadership, you have to step up and make a decision. You have to step up and you have to make a call. Because when it comes to leadership, regardless of what sector you're in, and this is applies to relationships, parenting, law enforcement and traffic safety. There will be leadership voids. There will be a point in time where somebody who is in a leadership position and who is also hopefully leading is not gonna be available. They might be sick. They might be on a phone call. They might be task saturated and a decision needs to be made. You need to teach your people and reinforce in your organization that when they encounter that environment, step into the void, make a call take charge. That doesn't mean you are in charge. It means you are filling a leadership void. It has to be taught. It has to be trained. And it absolutely has to be reinforced. The reason that I asked the question by a show of hands who here considers themselves to be a leader is that I want everybody in this room to think about if you did raise your hand, that's awesome. But think about the people that work for or with you. Would they raise their hand if asked the same question? And for those that didn't raise your hand, think about what I'm saying when it comes to terms of proactive versus reactive. And that leadership has nothing to do with title, rank, and position. If you encounter a leadership void and you are unwilling to raise your hand in a mixed audience, and by the way, I'll say this, the first time that I was asked that question, I did not raise my hand because I thought I was too young with too little experience and didn't know what was going on in the world. And it was taught and trained out of me that regardless of the environment that I am in, I will raise my hand because that's important and that's step number one, right? There's a second step that I'll close with, but the first one is realizing that you are a leader regardless of what you're wearing, regardless of your uniform insignia, regardless of your title, and regardless of your business card. It starts and stops with that self-realization. You have to foster that in your people if you want them to feel empowered to step into that void. Whoa, that's the backwards button. Closing takeaways. Like I said, I want to leave you with something that is practical. Everything that I've covered so far is not my own creation. It is me taking notes over a 17-year career and trying to reduce it into information that will make a difference. These five bullet points I actually wrote down on a uh, 3 by 5 index card one time, so I'm going to go ahead and say that they're my own intellectual property. 
Five practical steps that will improve you as a leader, regardless of what it is that you do for a living. The first one is control. Not your people, right? Don't be a psychopath. Control yourself. Control your emotions. And the goal of that is to maintain your ability of being self-aware. The second C is consider. As a leader, you will have more information than the people working for you, more than likely. You have to take the time to consider all of your available, all of your relevant information and options. If I learned one thing in the SEAL teams in a combat environment, it was this. There's always time. There's always time to literally or figuratively or metaphorically take a knee and take a breath to make a good decision than to rush into a bad decision and potentially spend the rest of your life trying to fight your way out of it. There's always time. So take that time and consider the uh, information, the options. And when it comes to actions, what that means is consider your actions. Consider your actions on the team, your actions on your organization and the people that you work with. Communicate. Communicate your intent and do it clearly and concisely. I have seen some amazing plans completely destroyed by simply layering in complexity. Keep it simple. Empower your people and don't micromanage. On this bullet point, if when I was talking about the litmus test for whether or not you are a micromanager, you started feeling a little bit uncomfortable in your seat because you go, uh-oh, my people do come to me and they do ask me what should I do. It's okay. Use that as a warning sign. What I would not recommend you do is go back tomorrow and completely change your behavior. That will unsettle your people actually even more. Recognize that it might be an issue and use it as something that you can work towards on your leadership journey. Work on empowering your people and having them figure the issues out instead of them constantly coming to you and looking for the advice. But if you do sit in your chair and it does make you uncomfortable, good, because that's what I'm trying to do, because micromanagers suck. And the last one, and what you should be focusing on, not doing your people's job, but doing your job as a leader. That's your job, lead. Don't do your people's job, do yours. See the chessboard, see all the squares, see all the other pieces and make decisions based off of that. <clears throat> In addition to these five, which I actually have these on a three by five index card. I don't have it with me, it sits on my desk. You have to recognize that you are a leader. If I filled this room with SEALs on their first day at work, but every one of them had successfully made it through the training pipeline, and a senior SEAL officer came in and asked this entire room, how many of you consider yourself to be a leader? How many hands do you think would go up? Every single one. And for the individual or individuals that did not have their hand go into the air, there's going to be consequences and they're going to be addressed immediately. Now, why would that happen? Because we teach our people and reinforce with our people that at all times they have to think of themselves as a leader. That's the importance of being able to raise your hand. That's the first step. The second step is you need to act like it. Recognize your leader and act like it. Teach and foster that mindset in your people from day one. Once you recognize you're a leader, you're going to understand the importance of standards. As a leader, if you are unwilling or are unable to hold the standard, why do you think that your people will put any effort into it? And when it comes to standards, let's be very clear. It doesn't matter what you say, and it doesn't matter what you write down and post somewhere on a wall. What matters is what you tolerate in your presence. So uh, to use the law enforcement world as an example, let's say you go to the academy together and you have a really good friend that you were friends with before the academy and the story arc of your career continues and you're now a captain and this individual works for you. And you have published standards. Be at work at 0800. Have already worked out. Be in uniform. A bunch of standards are listed out. And your people that work for you see that. You're there, right, at 7.50, right? Your people show up at 7.55 because five minutes early is on time. And that buddy of yours shows up at 8.20, disheveled, not having worked out. And you say nothing. What is your standard? 8.20. 
If you say nothing, your integrity as a leader and your trust in your subordinates is starting to erode. You have to avoid that at all costs. If you're a leader, one, recognize it. Two, act like it. Hold the standard. And then I'll leave you with, never forget your position on the team. And don't let your people forget their position either. They're going to follow your example. Do not lose sight of the big picture. And I'll leave you with an example of me doing exactly that and almost having a bunch of my friends get killed because I'm an idiot. This is a picture of a building in Iraq. This isn't the exact building, but it's close enough. Like I was saying, you know, from the days of sticks and stones, high ground is better than low ground. In this particular incident, we were on the street. We were approaching this building or a building very similar to this and we started taking fire from the second story window. <clears throat> we were unable to get off the street so we started to return fire but very rapidly we were overmatched and I wanted to utilize the most effective weapon that I've ever seen for opening and closing doors, starting and stopping arguments, whatever, this might be the best weapon on the face, the multi-tool on the face of the earth and it's a 2,000 pound GPS guided bomb. Like it starts and stops, it just handles everything. Like you lay one of these suckers out there and like, all right, I think the problem's good. So I started talking to the, uh, the pilot. And it's like, here's the deal, we're at the corner of the street. You know, we're 100 yards off the, uh, the building on the corner of the street. There's three white cars on the southern end of the building. I need you to put a bomb inside of that building. And the pilot said, I have absolutely no idea where you are. I have no idea what you're talking about. What are you talking about? It's a building right here. It's a two-story building. It's got red curtains. There's, there's uh, three vehicles right on the side. I need you to p drop a bomb into it. And again, I don't know where you are. Now, that radio call, I think I might have used some colorful language on the subsequent calls. The pilot never dropped, and I'm glad that he didn't. And we were able to escape the situation, and I'm very glad that we were able to do so. But it's important to understand how I got myself to that point as a leader. I was the officer in charge of that element. We were not the only element operating inside of that battle space. We were not the only element that was under fire at that time. And this actually was in the daytime because the target demanded that it be happened in the daytime. So that's when we actioned it. Rule number one of a firefight. What is it again? Win the firefight. I was with 15 other people carrying more than enough guns and ammunition to handle step one of a firefight, right? So while they were winning the firefight, my job as the leader was to maintain my objective situational awareness of where we were, where the other pieces were, and then maneuver or get supporting assets to come and help us. And I was unable to do so because in that moment, instead of doing my job, what I decided to do was the job of the people with me and I just laid down on my gun and I started shooting. And as soon as I did that, I lost sight of the bigger picture and I was unable to retain it or I was unable to regain that sight picture. We ran through the streets of Iraq like a bunch of idiots in the daytime getting shot at the entire time and it was only through pure luck that nobody got hurt or killed. And if somebody had been hurt or killed, whose fault would it have been? Mine, and 100% mine. The biggest failure was my lack of ability to maintain situational awareness. This was my chessboard, but it wasn't the actual board that we were playing on. Somebody point out the building with the three cars next to it. This was the chessboard. This was my job, and I didn't do it because I chose to micromanage I chose to forget my role on the team, and I chose to dive into the thing that I thought was fun, and it almost cost people their lives. Your role as a leader is to lead. Do your job. Enable your subordinates to do theirs so you can maintain this sight picture, this optic. This should be your world. As unfortunate as it is, bad leadership, in my experience, almost never terminates with the bad leader getting killed. It is always the people that work with or for that poor leader that end up suffering the consequences. Because believe me, I've worked with some bad leaders and we'd be on a helicopter and I would be in my own head, like, I wish, I hope you get shot in the face tonight. That's what I was telling myself. Because I hated this person. 
my mortal enemy. Like, I'm going to push you out of the helicopter if you don't get shot. And they would exhibit catastrophic leadership. And somebody would get hurt, but never that person. It was almost always the person that I had the most respect for that was the least deserving of what happened to them. But the leader seemed to survive. That mission, that day, that feeling of failure, and I owned it as soon as we got back to the base. I was like, listen, guys, first off, we got lucky, but secondly, that was on me. That has burned in me until this day. I got away with it. I got lucky. Use that as an example. When you start feeling that tug to get sucked down into the minutia, to get sucked into doing something that's a little bit more exciting, because leadership isn't always exciting, when you feel that tug, maybe just remember that slide. Your job as a leader is to lead. If you want to make a difference and you actually want to drive this towards zero deaths, that is the tool that I recommend you use. It will get you farther down the road than any other piece of weaponry or equipment that I've ever seen in my entire life. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you.